Hey, everybody. We're going to start in a few minutes. We'll just hang out and uh, promote it on Twitter and everything, and then we'll get started soon. It, the live stream randomly shut off when we were starting before. Hopefully, it goes smoothly. But we'll just mute it for a few minutes. Hey, all, we're muting you because we're just waiting a few minutes for people to show up. We're excited to get started here in a few minutes, but we're just going to mute you. Sorry.
Hello, are we on? Can you hear us? Give us, give us some feedback in chat if you can hear us. There's some latency, but hopefully we'll start seeing some. Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> Somebody just said sound problem. <laughs> OK, you can hear us. Good. OK, awesome. We're on. We're on. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the AMA. With myself, I'm Mick, founder and CEO, Sarah Wiley, VP of Engineering, and Neil Bly, VP of Product. We're excited to be here. We just launched the Mainframe OS Developer Edition yesterday. And so we're here to talk about that, answer any questions that you might have related to that. We'll share a little bit about the roadmap, what's to come. We've got the big public release early April for end users and for the general public. And so we're here to engage with our community and, and discuss some important topics. Where do we begin? Uh, let's talk a little bit about Mainframe OS and uh, what it is and what people can do with it today and what they should expect coming up soon. So what would you guys say are the key value propositions of Mainframe OS? If we had to summarize it for the audience maybe who's not as familiar or hasn't been paying close attention to it, what would you all say is the, the key value propositions? So, yeah. <laughs> so at Mainframe, we've always had uh, a few guiding principles. We've been pretty strong in promoting a future of decentralization. Uh, on top of that, we also believe that this future of decentralization needs to have, it needs to be accessible to a wider user base than just what we currently see in this space. So we put design first, we put security first, privacy first, decentralization. These are kind of pillars of the philosophy we have here at Mainframe. So today, with the new developers edition, we have collected, uh, we've abstracted some of the, the emerging technologies that are coming out, as well as allowed a place for the developers to engage with their users for adapt discovery. Um, to be able to have users show up with contacts, wallets, uh, identity, which is a complex uh, problem to solve in this space. And so we want with an easy click install that the users will have everything they need to engage with the developer's dApps, looking towards this decentralized future. Sarah, anything to add? Yeah, so it's a, it's a desktop application that you can use to run dApps now. You know, why I can already run apps in uh, Chrome with uh, some an extension. Why should I d download Mainframe OS? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of things going on in uh, applications run in your browser. There's lots of things going on with uh, your data behind the scenes. There are, beyond what we could reasonably expect a typical user to understand. Uh, so. If we are able to create an environment where the least technical user can engage into this ecosystem without worrying about uh, privacy concerns, uh, if there are any access to any wallets, any access to any information, any kind of Web2 calls, we notify the user. The user doesn't have to come prepared. They already are secure first, and then we invite them to tell us through permissioning systems how, how much more you want to give that DAP that information. And so uh, we kind of take that reverse approach. Instead of trying to um, tack a plugin onto a web experience to understand just how to interact with a wallet, we provide a safe house that yeah. you can just assume there's a reasonable expectation that you are secure, you are private, and uh, we have you have your, we have the best intentions for the user to feel yeah. safe. I think one of the, um, one of the big discussion points that we had as a team was, you know, should we allow Web2 dApps? So for example, things like CryptoKitties. We all love CryptoKitties. Should we allow CryptoKitties to run inside the mainframe OS <clears throat> and, and other dApps like that that require MetaMask? And this was a discussion that we had a lot of debate around. But ultimately, we decided not to because we're essentially saying, you know what, we're drawing a line in the sand and we're saying we're giving users full control of the experience. We're giving them the privacy that they deserve and that they should have, that everyone should have. We're giving them the ability to, be, to see what requests are being made, what Web2 requests are being made. 
And by allowing CryptoKitties or these other kind of Web2 dApps to come in, we would be compromising on a lot of those principles. And we recognize that, okay, we got to have some amazing dApps that need to come into the mainframe OS. And so we're going to work with partners on that. We're going to build a few. Um, but ultimately, we thought we would put the user in full control. Allowing these Web2 dApps to exist within mainframe OS is just more of the same. It's, it's more walled gardens. It's more, it's more tracking of data, manipulating user behavior to do certain things. It's just more Web2. They're not really decentralized. They're not really offering any new things around privacy and security. And so that's one of the things uh, that's powerful about mainframe OS is it's a very it's a very it's an environment in which users have full control of their data and full control of the experience. And the other thing we've enabled through mainframe OS is uh, we're promoting uncensorable, unstoppable dApps, and we do that through an integration with uh, with Swarm. That's the current um, uh, integration protocol, but but it's a very similar and, and will also um, potentially in the future include an integration with IPFS so that, that dApps can be hosted in a decentralized way um, and, and then used inside mainframe OS without the user having to know anything about those underlying nodes or you know, how to set them up or how to access them, how to configure them, anything like that. So that's one of the, you know, one of the most powerful things I think um, is you know ensuring against major uh, censoring that we've seen happen in the in the last year. So, DApps developed and published and access in mainframe OS are unstoppable. Yeah, I mean that's one of the killer value propositions. Yeah, and and um the, and and building on top of mainframe leverages our engineering team to stay on top of all of these emerging technologies. So as as uh, we you know we work directly with the, the swarm team. We work um, we're looking at all of these different options uh, and figure out ways to to glue this together in a way that uh, you kind of we want to be able to future proof a developer wanting to come into this space. We want them to have the confidence that we are a partner with them in identifying the leading emerging technologies and stitching it in together so that they don't have to comb, comb all the different developer websites and kind of be inundated with too much knowledge. So it's a little, it's, it's daunting to enter this space as a developer. We want to lower that barrier of entry to invite all of, all of the brain power, all of the cleverest yeah. developers who haven't jumped into this space. We, we, we want more people in this space and we want to make it easy to jump in. Yep. So to summarize key value propositions of mainframe OS, we give user full control of their data, their identity, their privacy. Uh, developers will not be able to uh, track or hack or censor or manipulate users in any way. And so there's kind of the privacy and security aspect, and then there's the unstoppable dApps aspect. So when dApps are deployed using the mainframe platform, these dApps are completely unstoppable. They can't be censored. They can't be taken down. That's compelling. And you know we've seen countless examples of people not being able to communicate with messaging apps, people getting deplatformed uh, uh, on places like YouTube or Twitter, people getting demonetized. And so um, those are some of the key value propositions of mainframe OS. And, and the third that we haven't really talked about, but we'll talk really briefly right now is we are working very, very hard to make it a great user experience, right? There's so much interesting technology getting built in this space, really cutting edge stuff. Um, we are just as thoughtful and as careful about the user experience as we are about the technology and as we are about some of these other things. So should we bring our first guest for our AMA to yeah, talk a little bit about user experience? Clément, uh, Clément Jacquier, our Swiss designer, uh, come join us as our first guest. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we begin? Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, maybe, Clement, you could just explain a little bit how the role of design has played into the mainframe story. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so design has always been very important for mainframe. So since the beginning, well, like, uh, so we care about design. We want to make sure that we can have, we can align our values um, and convey that to the to the audience, with like uh, with the the right uh, shapes, colors, um, design. So that that was like the first uh, first um, uh, how we started with to to or like approach to design. 
and also not we we don't want to. Um, it's not just about making things look good, but also we truly believe that actually through design you can um, it can make a change. So that change, um, we believe that we can uh, we can make it through um, applications through like uh, our uh, identity, and <clears throat> we need to align also like design so with the tech. So it's not only about design, but like it's also about tech. Uh, the thing is, design is that's the first thing that people can see. So they get a first impression. They get a, that's how you com communicate with people. That's how you convey emotions. So that's why we we talk about design first. It's because when you're gonna download the mainframe OS, you will get a feel right away of like you know the, all those shapes, the colors. The and also most importantly the 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 user experience. How you're gonna like the flow? How you're gonna be? Uh, uh, you're gonna take that journey, and is it gonna be like easy? And so that's the the first impression you're gonna get. And as I said, <clears throat> it's also very important to link that to tech because you want it to work like smoothly and and perfectly. So we. We make sure that we can work with the, the engineers and have like a uh, like top notch like design and same for tech. Yeah, we uh, or go ahead. Are you gonna say something? No, uh, was about to I say was, something. Let me just say this. <laughs> um, you know, hopefully developers will come build DApps on the main on mainframe OS for its great technology, uh, for a lot of just the underlying infrastructure that we're providing. But, but we strongly believe that one of the most compelling reasons developers will come and build dApps on mainframe OS is because they know that their users are going to have a great experience with mainframe OS. And so you know, we're spending a lot of time on onboarding, on making sure it's a really smooth process as people set up their wallet, they set up their identity, they, they, you know, they get onboarded into crypto. And you know, we're thinking a lot about fiat on ramps. Make it really, we'll talk in a second about some meta transactions to make that even smoother. But we're thinking a lot about that, about the end user experience, because if we can build a strong audience of users, of, of engaged users, of users who are passionate and excited about our, our user experience, then we know developers are going to come and want to build dApps. So that's why it is so important that we get a lot of this stuff right. Yeah, yeah I think from a product perspective, uh, the importance of user experience is even doubly so in this space. Mm -hmm. We talk about things like wallets, identities, uh, we talk about uh, off the chain, different, different, all, uh, so much, so much new terminology for users and developers alike. That uh, at mainframe, it's become really important, and we think leveraging good design. And we're going to speak a little bit more to some of our marketing angles to get this message out. But design, by investing as much into design, we feel it's a critical way to overcome some of these. Uh, the, the, these, this new tech, there's a gap between this emerging tech and the general public's understanding of it. And to just be able to make the tech work isn't going to cross that chasm. So we, we want to leverage great design. We want to leverage powerful marketing messages. Uh, it'll, it'll take all of that to, uh -huh. to bring this all together. So Clement, there is a question on here about how, how do we handle um, these long strings of numbers and characters that can be intimidating and scary to users. Uh -huh. do, is it better to like hide that completely? Do we expose it? How do we make it accessible and yet also to some users that gives them a sense of security that they uh -huh. aren't exposed? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good question because it's a design challenge to get you know that long you know string and how you do you make that like nice and like also easy to easy to use so what has been used so far is like the qr code that like some sort of like a uh easier way and uh and visually nicer just to uh to to use um i would say we need to actually that's a challenge we need to come up and uh, and try to solve it and see how we what we can do and then one are actually you know, like a uh, next step, like, so like how we can deal with, it, with that. Because so far, what we've done is so, like, so QR code, we have, uh, we can also like truncate the, the address if it's not as important on the uh, specific step. Sometimes it's important because you want a security, so you have to, to, to show the full string. 
and but you have a lot of like different like hacks you can do you can uh, uh, have the beginning of the string and then you can show more and then you see the entire string you could um, also uh, you can like hide it completely and just have a button to to show it so uh, if you for example if you are like a coinbase user you can see how they deal with that they only show the address at the last step they never show an address to someone just because it might be scary for like beginners for like first users so they still show it because that's part of blockchain that's the the core um like the, the core functionality or like mechanism is like using that that word address but you can show that at like uh, maybe at different steps depending on your audience you might be you know at the end or like hide it show it uh, at specific uh, times one, one thing we have um introduced in mainframe os which i think is also very different than other kind of development and execution environments is the concept of kind of a, a public identity that can be shared with other users and um, I, when you sign up or, or when you go through the uh, onboarding process and you set up your own identity, you can, you can decide and, and um, specify whether you want your uh, name, whatever your user readable name, it doesn't have, you know, pseudonym or real name or whatever, to be visible by other users. And um, then once you connect with those other users, then they can um, know you by that name and not necessarily need to interact using this long stream. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I think that's a step in the process. But yeah, like you said, I think it's important that those those underlying keys are there because uh -huh. that's what makes it, like you said, the mechanism of the blockchain and, and the decentralized environment that people feel secure and, and need to, to know that that's there, but then we can build on that to kind of make it just a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. And also make it like more personal. As a, um, as Sarah said, on the on the OS, we want to make sure that the experience is more personal. You can have, you know, like names or Excel, like having those like addresses, you can, uh, uh, it would be a lot easier to, if I want to get, get, I have like a, like Sarah's name and then, then I can see all like the addresses like linked to that name and so like having to deal with like all the addresses first. Cool. All right, thank you so much, Clement, for You're joining welcome. us on this special <laughs> AMA. Uh, the one thing I will say, just to emphasize, we are 100% committed to making it easier for people to adopt crypto, to adopt decentralized technologies. We will continue to be focused on that. I mean, we know that the market for like users in crypto is still pretty small right now. And so we're gonna continue to explore ways and products and features and ideas in which we can bring more adoption and, and more onboarding into kind of Web3. Yeah. And Clement is, is playing a very big part of that. Mm -hmm. so and that's the next step. We're going to work hard on that, making sure that we can uh, you like uh, show that tech to most people. Like, there are plenty of people that are, like, don't know how to use that, uh, that technology, and we'll, we'll, do, uh, we'll work on that to make sure it's accessible to to uh, like a broader audience. Where, uh, before you leave, where's Julia? I want to introduce Julia to us. Oh, audience. she was there because I was worried like she, she would balk, you know, but <laughs> I can bring her. Okay, maybe uh, later, maybe later, uh, uh, later it's Julia. just have her uh, Julia appearance. And Julia is <laughs> Clement's beautiful lion or dog, <laughs> but she's kind of hangs out at the office. All right, uh, I, thanks Clement for joining us. You're welcome, us. thank you. <clears throat> Um, since Clement's gone now, we can say that he's the best designer in the world, <laughs> and we're lucky to have him. Yes, indeed. And he's built a great team. So. Exactly. Um, Should we? A lot of questions on the chat are around MFT and how MFT fits we'll into probably this. Probably talk about that. Let's talk about that. That's pretty important. Um, should we bring our next guest to yeah. help us shed some more light on it? He'll be very. Good. So Doug Leonard, <laughs> the the star of well, one of the stars of Dawn of the Daps. Uh, this is yeah. Doug, he has his own lemon uh, lemonade stand and <laughs> lemon coin. I think he's also the star of our our uh, launch video that just went out yesterday. That's true. Yeah, the price of crypto was tanking though, so it wasn't my best performance. <laughs> is this is, is all of this, is this getting to your head, Doug, like being the star <laughs> of, of so many of these videos? Absolutely. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Um, cool, so MFT token utility, where do we begin? Where do we start? Okay, so I think it's fair to start with like uh, history. 
so that we can have context for where we're at right now. So MFT token utility remains the same as it always has. Uh, MFT will be used to incentivize resource providers on the network. So this is especially important as we look for how we're onboarding people who maybe don't have even access to an exchange. I can imagine a day when uh, somebody who has the compute power of a smartphone can plug into a mainframe, the mainframe network, earn enough uh, MFT to then participate and become a consumer on it. So a zero cost onboarding. So this is, you know, very forward looking and, uh, you know, off in the future quite a bit, but it is the resource providers that will receive MFT for the utility that they um, provide to the network. So each layer of our stack uh, is going to have some mechanism and uh, a, a distinct uh, economic model for it. So you can think of uh, the storage, the compute, um, and identity as the core layers that we're aware of right now, where we'll be adding that. And then we've just started exploring a, an additional layer with user onboarding and meta transactions. And so as we've gone through the process of uh, first vetting out that the technology is mature enough and ready to add the incentivization to, um, we have to be careful not to add additional complexity before the tech is ready. So uh, let's take, for example, storage, which is the most mature in this space right now. Um, as we've built on top of uh, the Ethereum Swarm uh, storage layer, the incentivization uh, aspect of it is a lower priority to the actual stability and uh, distributed storage aspects of uh, the technology. So. Uh, we have had ourselves to reset our own expectations internally for each layer uh, on when we could integrate the incentivization uh, to that specific layer. So uh, what can we expect? Well, you can expect that uh, the team generally and uh, especially me are very keen on uh, getting a uh, the token utility as soon as we feel confident that it's uh, ready. Um, so, uh, for example, as we've had to reset our expectations on certain layers, our attention is focused to uh, meta transactions and uh, incentivizing uh, the user onboarding experience so that, uh, for example, DAP creators can pay for the gas of onboarding uh, their users into their ecosystem. So this is something that we hope to both uh, integrate deeply with the SDK and uh, have uh, a working prototype uh, very soon, TM. And the reason why like, you're not gonna get really any project in the space to commit to a very specific deadline on uh, aspects is crucial to this is because it has to be done right. Like the whole economy that we're building, uh, the fundamentals need to be vetted and any, uh, rushing or cutting of corners uh, that that might be had will uh, definitely cost you more in the long run. So uh, nothing has changed with token utility. Uh, it will incentivize resource providers, and um, and we are focusing on the layers that will bring that to us the soonest. So without giving like specific hard <laughs> commits on when you will see it. Uh, know that it is at the top of uh, my priority list. So, can you um, quickly describe the impact that some of these ideas will have on the onboarding experience? You know, we were yes. talking to Clement, talking about making it really easy for users to get onboarded and start engaging with the DAP. Can you explain how exactly that that will work? Yes. Yeah, so you, you can imagine, that, like for example, we have a broad audience. We have people like me who. Have, uh, a high level of comfort with uh, managing their own private keys. You have people like my mother who um, are less comfortable. But and it's very interested in playing crypto kitties. Yes, right? um, yeah. my mom does bring up at least twice a month <laughs> on uh, my phone calls to her, where is my crypto kitty? <laughs> and uh, I haven't shared it with her because uh, she, I think, will lose it. So. <laughs> Uh, and although I have plenty of crypto kitties to spare, 
uh, I, I think I am waiting for the onboarding experience that is uh, going to give her the confidence and me the confidence that this isn't something that can be mismanaged um, without a high degree of confidence. So, uh, what's so so talking about like if we want to onboard the next million users into blockchain, uh, which is absolutely what the uh, our driving goal is, along with many other in the community, then we have to uh, move past and abstract away friction points like paying for gas, uh, especially within Ethereum, but gas plays a very important role, but it is uh, both confusing uh, and a, a drop off point for, uh, for people in their first experiences interacting with blockchain. So uh, anybody who, um, so, so there are a couple of projects where I can point to that uh, are sort of on the front uh, of this. So if you look at uh, Cryptogs, which is uh, playing Pogs on the uh, Ethereum blockchain, it was a project by Austin Griffith that was born out of ETH Denver last year. At this point, you can go on and he leverages these meta transactions, which enables the uh, developer to wrap a transaction on behalf of a user who doesn't have any uh, Ethereum and enables them to start transacting with your dApp immediately. So this is a, an experience that gets you closer to um, what most people are familiar with within their mobile apps, in-app purchases, et cetera. And it also enables the developer a more broad uh, opportunity in terms of how they choose to monetize the dApp. Um, so it, there are some alternatives to uh, a you know, dApp ICO model. So th this is exciting uh, because you don't have to reteach consumers. Uh, they can do an in-app purchase for credits, and then that can those credits can be exchanged uh, on chain for uh, for gas that the developer is then managing for them. So uh, everybody wins in terms of uh, we have new users on the blockchain. We have additional utility that can be had uh, for them, and uh, and then they don't necessarily have to wait for like a KYC process uh, to occur. Um, uh, on a traditional exchange. Cool. There was there was one question in I think it was in on Twitter uh, yesterday that the person couldn't be here with us today, so he, he asked a few questions. One question that he asked was, "Why do we need uh, MFT? Why do we need our own token?" Yeah. So this is a, a very important question. So Mainframe's vision expands beyond just Ethereum uh, itself, and it, it is much much broader. It is like we want to push forward uh, blockchain as a technology, uh, decentralization, privacy. So these are big, uh, ambitious uh, goals that, that we need a first class citizen that can jump between ecosystems, that can leverage the different protocols and, uh, and make it easier for the developers who are trying to build and leverage uh, new technologies as they um, emerge. Uh, you, you can now leverage something that you've become familiar with. So uh, one example, you know, the easy example here is uh, today we're on Ethereum. We, we have uh, previously announced intentions to integrate with other block blockchains, Tezos being one of those. And so if you want to take advantage of a unique property on both Ethereum and Tezos, or if you potentially you wanted to port something like uh, your ERC-721 collectibles like CryptoKitties to then uh, to do more of a real-time game on a blockchain that has uh, smaller tra or uh, shorter transaction times, then uh, you can bring those assets over and MFT can help uh, manage the bridge and the economics of that bridge. So uh, a quick example of where we're, we're seeing this type of technology is in the POA network's uh, hard spoon of Ethereum that uses DAI as their uh, native asset. There is a bridge between uh, DAI and what, what they uh, call XDAI, um, which is the native asset on the side chain, which has five second blockchains or five second block times. And uh, it enabled a more, uh, a more 
consumer friendly version at ETH Denver. We were paying for all of our meals on the XDAI chain, but the vendors at the end of the event were able to cash out into uh, air quotes real die, uh, at which they could then exchange for money on the open market. So uh, this is an example uh, of, of a bridge mechanism that uh, MFT will, as a first class citizen, enable dApps that build on our platform to extend themselves into uh, emerging technologies as we make them available through our SDK. Yeah. Another thing that I always like to talk about when, when people ask this question of why do we need our own token, uh, I think from a technical perspective, Doug has, has nailed it. Um, but I think from a game theory and economics perspective, the reason why we need our own token is we need a token that is directly uh, and, and intrinsically correlated and connected to our network, to our community. Because some people say, well, why don't you just use BTC or why don't you use ETH? And the problem is, by using those, uh, our, uh, the, the growth of our network and the growth of our community would not impact or correlate to the token price of, of those things, right? And so, as you know, speculators is probably the wrong word to use here, but as we think about incentivization and as we think about MFT being used as a way to incentivize um, people who are perform, you know, sharing resources and performing duties on the network, you know, they're incentivized and, and they want MFT, they want the MFT token price to appreciate, right? And and the ability for MFT to token, uh, the ability for the token price to appreciate is much more correlated to their efforts and their work than BTC or than ETH, right? It's something that they can directly impact because that token is directly connected to this network and this community. And so that's one of the just economic reasons why we want our own token is we want the early participants on our network to be rewarded and rewarded in a big way. If our community and our network grows, they will see that you know they they will not just get um, they will not get paid in some sort of relatively stable currency, but that could, could potentially be a, a very um, a, appreciative asset. Uh, and, and so it's tricky to talk about kind of speculation and these sorts of things. But it's important to remember that these people who are who are sharing resources on the network early on, they need to be motivated. They need to be incentivized, and that's one of the powerful things about decentralization and using tokens as a form of incentivization. So that's that's really one of the main kind of economic and game theory reasons why we want MFT to be directly connected and correlated to the growth of our community and our network. So one question that we get often and that I've seen here is, do we have our own blockchain, and if uh, not when will we or why don't we? Ooh, I like this one. So we don't currently have our own blockchain. We're using the Ethereum blockchain, as Doug said. Uh, we're looking to integrate with other blockchains. We've announced kind of a Tezos partnership. Um, but I think you know every time we've talked about do we create our own blockchain, we've always asked ourselves why. What are the limitations or the constraints of existing blockchains that would make us want to create our own? And I would say once we find those constraints and as we further go down the road of enabling developers to build unstoppable dApps, then it is a possibility. And, and we can kind of cross that, that bridge when we get there. It is a possibility that we do create a new blockchain with the purpose and focus of, of making it easier for these dApps to truly be unstoppable, to create more privacy for users, et cetera. Yes. I, Ultimately, a mainframe. Everywhere we try to, find, where everywhere we encounter friction ourselves, we will try to reduce that for both the user and the developer. So, in the event that we find reason to participate in creating our own chain, to uh, tweaking, improving on the chain, we'll absolutely we're up for that challenge, and that we'll go down that road. Um, but in the meantime. Uh, we, we love what everyone else is doing in the community on that, and we're finding ways to uh, provide value in between all of these spaces and being part of a, of a glue in this community. So th this is what we're seeing in the space and why, uh, why making or uh, doing our own blockchain today uh, is not making sense, but in the future wow. might. So right now, you take, take a look at the projects uh, with, with Dogecoin and Litecoin and the relationship that they've had to forge there. And then also take a look at the uh, struggles that we've seen from Ethereum Classic uh, over the past uh, several months as uh, you could purchase for a reasonable amount of money a 51% attack on services like NiceHash. 
So if we were to create our own chain, it, in, in, it uh, adds additional layers of complexity for us uh, that we have to manage. So, and if we don't do it right, things go uh, very poorly, very fast. And so the, the value proposition of doing, doing our own chain has to offset the risk and the management and cost of, uh, of what we're seeing with Ethereum Classic. Um, and right now, the novelty that we, uh, that this whole space is inventing is very uh, focused around throughput and uh, some of the proof of stake uh, consensus, consensus mechanisms. So there is so much experimentation happening around choosing the right proof of, uh, or the right consensus mechanism for different blockchains that uh, that we need to watch and learn from their experiences before we pioneer out uh, with our own novelty. So uh, it's so so the, the relationship between Dogecoin and Litecoin is Doge has actually. Um, bridged their security model to the security of Litecoin because uh, they saw it sufficiently, uh, they saw it a sufficient threat uh, to manage their own set of miners who could profit elsewhere. So, so you're seeing these uh, projects uh, work together and, uh, and help protect themselves, um, some might say by centralizing themselves onto uh, the hashing power of each other. So th there are uh, pros and cons of this. You know, miners of Litecoin now can opt to receive Dogecoin as well. But uh, if you just wanted to go and purely mine Dogecoin, uh, there, there's just not like a really efficient way to go about it. So, so, so yeah, this is the state of uh, both consensus considerations and the, the projects that we're learning from. Uh, but. Yeah, it would be uh, novel and cool, but the properties that it adds to our platform would have to justify the cost. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think uh, we've all appreciated your presence, Doug. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for <laughs> stopping by. I loved having me on as well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll see you in the next amazing viral video, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see you. <laughs> Don't go too far. Um, cool. So there, is, there are a few other questions. There's one question that Cat House is asking in uh, the, the the YouTube chat. We heard some team members left mainframe. Who is on the official roster now? So that is a great question, and it's a question that's important that we let's tie that in with another question that I saw, which has maybe a little bit more positive spin to it, or uh, like ties it into our positive outlook on things. Because the other question was. Um, you've expressed a lot of confidence in our project because of our team. And what is it about our team in particular that gives you that level of confidence or that you think we can achieve that maybe others can't? Yeah, those are great questions. So one, you know, this is, it's no surprise that this is the uh, crypto nuclear winter, the crypto bear market. And uh, at our peak, in terms of headcount, we had around 27, 28 people. Um, but over the last few months, over the last several months, I, I mean, obviously the whole 2018 was just a constant downward trend. But October, November, December was particularly tough for the whole market. And we had to make some really tough decisions. You know, we had to make sure that we had plenty of resources and plenty of runway so that we could execute on these exciting things that we're talking about. And so we had to let a few people go. Uh, the, the, a few people transitioned to part-time, a few people are now kind of more advisors, a few people we helped find their next thing in a very smooth uh, kind of transition. Um, all incredibly talented people and these moments are always tough and hard not fun. I hate these moments of, and this isn't unique to crypto. This is startup life, right? Sometimes you're in a startup, it's, it, things are going well, and then the next year things cannot be going well, and you have to let some people go. And so our current full-time headcount is 19 people. Um, most of the people that we had to kind of let go were in marketing uh, and kind of business, uh, finance, uh, so much of the history, and our next guest will actually bring in Austin on marketing, so much of the history of, of Mainframe has been, a, 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 been around creating incredible video content. Uh, Dawn of the Daps, the Lemon Coin video, we have, we, we've done a, a lot of amazing things. 
uh, around video. And so we're sticking with the incredible video team that we have. Um, and so we've reduced the marketing team to down to what is kind of the heart and soul of mainframe marketing, which is video. Um, so amazing people like Pete Abila, I know some of you know, you know, he, he went to Thunder. And I love Chris and Elaine at Thunder. I was one of the first investors at Thunder back in January or December, or, you know, January of 2018. So I'm a big fan of Thunder. Um, but you know, Pete, incredibly talented person. We just had to make really tough decisions so that we could reduce the cost and the burn so that we could have plenty of time to figure some of this stuff out. So again, these were, um, these were decisions that were hard. We needed to make them. Um, but I'm as optimistic as ever about the future. And yeah, to Sarah's point, we have an incredible team here. You know, Sarah, VP of engineering, had super organized and just execution focused. And I think the team loves you, Sarah. No, no um, I'm too bad that I asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Neil, incredible product mind, uh, very technical. So he and and for this type of product, mainframe OS, it, it requires somebody who's a lot more technical. And Neil has has been incredible. Um, obviously, we were talking about our, our video team, uh, incredible video team. We just met Doug, who's one of our incredible engineers and, and strategic thinkers. Clement and and Jordan, another designer. So top to bottom, you know, Brad, my brother, incredible uh, strategic um, kind of business development hustler. The, the team is just stacked with incredible people still. Um, but yeah, it's it, it was a hard hard phase for, for mainframe, but we're, um, one thing that, we're getting through it. Uh, one thing that I, I uh, noticed or, you know, we kind of uh, connected with other projects at East Denver mm -hmm. on this point of how we're all weathering this season together and um, that it, it definitely opens up the need for collaboration and um, partnerships and working together with other projects also trying to do big hard things and that actually um, creates a, a really great collaborative innovative environment um, you know sometimes those uh, those times of need are where some of the greatest um, you know progress happens. Yeah, I, I think our recent uh, conference experiences has led this idea that the, the community is an extension. Uh, so I don't mean this to sound such like a soft answer, but there's there's this feeling of community within all of these communities. And uh, those that come through mainframe and move on from mainframe, that we don't, we will not see the last of them. They, um, many of these that have come, they've gone to, uh, potential partners and projects we are looking at and you know uh, as as we find out at mainframe what we do best and where we are able to make the biggest impact we are also very proud that those of us that have come with us to this point and then see where they start going out in the field because ultimately it's it's going to take all of us to make this succeed it's going to take more than just uh, the projects we have at mainframe to bring in the kind of user adoption that we want to see to be able to paint and realize this vision that we're aiming towards so uh, yeah I, I this this is how startups work and we we see our extended family being built yeah yeah so again we're excited about the future and um, you know, somebody was asking about Carl so Carl is still an advisor Carl is an incredible mind an incredible thinker you know, as we were traveling around a lot, speaking at conferences and meetups, Carl was a really important part to that kind of evangelization. And he's going to continue to do that, you know, with mainframe and on behalf of mainframe as an advisor, but from a day-to-day -day engineering perspective and kind of day-to-day -day management of, of, of what we're developing, what we're working on, you know, these are the two people who are, who have been leading that for many months now. And so Carl um, kind of moving more to the side, in practice doesn't change a whole lot you know he'll continue to be a great champion of mainframe and and the mission that we're on so somebody asked about carl so that's carl and then kaylin you know kaylin sharp is one of my close friends for many many years you know we worked on a startup you know six years ago together a uh, great friend and he's he, he he's an entrepreneur successful entrepreneur sold the company for 20 million dollars and so I convinced him to, hey, like we don't have anybody leading product right now. Can you just come over for as long as you want? 
before you go crazy because you want to get back on the golf course. Just come help us get this thing going. And so, you know, he joined us for around a year to get, he brought, he brought in Neil, you know, he basically would found his replacement. Uh, and so, so Kaylin, again, we continue to be great friends. He continues to invest. He continues to play golf. He continues to travel. He's an incredible person. Um, but the plan for him was never kind of this full time forever thing, uh, which is why, you know, he was able to bring in Neil and, and, and that's who we have. But, but all of these people, again, continue to be great friends, continue to be part of the extended mainframe family. They come in often. We see these people come in. We have lunch with them. I golf with Kaylin. Um, there are no, you know, there, there were no major kind of blow ups as much as we all like to pretend or imagine there's some sort of scandal or drama going on at mainframe. There's no drama. Um, this is the crypto winter. We've had to make some adjustments and, and we carry forward. Here's a good question. Are you guys having fun? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're having a lot of fun. I mean, this is, what do you guys think? Yeah, how's the ping pong tournaments going well? It's got good ping pong tournaments. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, I mean, again, uh, we just, you know, two weeks ago, we were out at ETH Denver, and then right after that, we brought in everyone from the company. Uh, those, the, our teams from London, our team from Brazil, uh, obviously the teams from here in Utah, and yeah, we 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 just yeah we just tackled some projects and really exciting stuff, stuff that we have coming up, stuff. Um, yeah, a lot of fun. A lot yeah, of fun. there's a uh, lot we of really, excitement. We really do have a, a great group of people that that we we work with, and like Neil said, a few weeks ago we brought we have four people in London, four people in London. We brought them out. Uh, most of the team is here in Utah. We're in Lehigh, Utah right now. But just spent a lot of time together, kind of regroup, you know, launching mainframe OS, um, putting together our roadmap. Some people were asking about our roadmap. We should talk about that in a second. Uh, we're opening up an office in Brazil. You know, we spent a lot of time down there getting to know the community, doing meetups. Um, you know, we already have a few people down there. We're going to be extending more job offers soon to some incredible Brazilian engineers. Uh, so yeah, this is a lot of fun. Fun. I mean, we're at the we're at the at the at the frontier, right? Like this is the frontier of of Web three and decentralization. And and you know, since September, one of the things that I've been talking about a lot at all the meetups and the conferences that I speak at is around the why. Like why, as hard as this is, and as frustrated as sometimes we are with the technology and kind of the immaturity of of, of some of the tech. Um, and the hard moments that, that we had to face in the last few months, the, the, the thing that motivates me so much is I really believe that Web3 and kind of decentralized technology can help level the playing field. Uh, you know, uh, talent and, and brilliance is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. And Web3 essentially can allow people all over the world to participate in this global economy, this global marketplace, without governments or bureaucracy or corruption or middlemen to tell them they can't, that, that they can't participate. They can't provide for their families and, and, and you know, be part of this, this global economy. And, and this, so yeah, this is a lot of fun because this is an exciting vision and mission that we're on. Um, and I have fun every day doing it. I think, you know, sometimes my wife will ask like, you know, like, why are you so stressed out? And it's like, it's a good stress though. It's not like a stress that is like that. It's like, I, I love this stuff. It's fun, it's hard, it's messy, um, but it's exciting, right? We're at the beginning of something really special, so. Yeah, I agree. All right, um, let's see, what are some other questions? Well, somebody asked why Brazil? So let's, just, let's talk about that. So I lived in Brazil for a couple of years. Uh, we've got an incredible developer already from Brazil and was living there named Gioco, a kind of front-end developer. We've got an incredible hustler. Her name is Babi. She's based there. Carl and Kaylin uh, also speak Portuguese. So we have history living in Brazil, working with Brazilian developers. Um, and, and the other thing about South America just more generally is cryptocurrency is, is, is just on the rise. And, and there are a lot of people there who just are losing, like everywhere in the world, but especially in, in South America, they're losing trust in their, their governments. They're losing a lot of trust in, in their leaders. Uh, and not, they're losing trust in their financial institutions. There's just 
a, there's just a lack of trust that continues to grow there, similar all over the world, but especially there, you see places like Venezuela with hyperinflation, uh, you know, Argentina recently having hyperinflation. You have a lot of people there who are, who are kind of hacker mentality, meaning the, they don't have a lot of the infrastructure to, uh, to enable success and growth in the economy, but they're hackers and they just try to figure out a way to do it. And so you combine kind of the macro uh, political climate, government kind of situation with just the mentality they have of trying to take destiny into their own hands. And South America is gonna be a huge juggernaut for bringing decentralization to the masses. There's a very large population that's unbanked, similar to other parts of the world. But So these are a few reasons why we wanna be on the ground in South America. We've got connections to Brazil, uh, and we wanna help bring you know millions, hundreds of millions, tens, hundreds of millions of people into Web3. And that's gonna be a good place to do that. So hopefully that answers the question of why Brazil. Should we talk a little about the roadmap? Let's do it. Where are things going from here? Yeah, so uh, we just, you know, yesterday was the launch for the developer preview edition. Sorry, not the preview edition, but the developer preview edition because we're preparing for another public launch in April uh, with uh, DAP. We, I'll, let, I'll let Mick explain a little bit around details around that. Um, but something to say is one of the things we've realized is we're, we're always wrestling with this changing technology. We're not necessarily in control of what we can do with Swarm, what we can do with different protocols as they're, as they're emerging. And, uh, you know, every, I, I make a lot of uh, jokes, or in fact, that's, that's kind of what makes it fun in this space, is I start one week and we're starting to go down a path, and by the end of the week, someone has invented whole new tools and Legos to play with that allow us to kind of recalibrate our, our roadmap. One of the things we've, uh, understood is if we want developers to have users, we also want to make commitments to bringing dApps that users want to build. So one of the bigger conversation changes around this office is how do we participate and, and, and beyond just the infrastructure that we're still committed to, we posted an updated roadmap uh, a couple of weeks ago preparing for our ETH Denver visit and we will continue to update that one to keep that dynamic but we're shifting now shifting some of our resources internally to do what we're asking everyone else to do and we're going to we're going to touch on that a little bit too uh, about uh, how we want to extend the, the our bounties but we we understand that to get users we need awesome dapps yeah, that is a good segue into um, one of the things we wanted to promote today and with this launch is um, that we've extended our, our bounty challenges that we kind of started when we went to Eat Denver. Um, and we are offering money, real money, for um, dApps built in mainframe OS um, that meet certain criteria. And uh, we're looking for dApps that make a social impact. We're looking for dApps that are beautiful and have a great user experience. And we're looking for dApps that leverage our SDK and what we have to offer to be as unstoppable as possible. Um, and uh, so we would love any participants to come meet us on our Gitter channel, which you can get to from community.mainframe.com. Um, and we have We'll, we have our engineering team kind of on call to help people through getting going on that. And it's it's really, um, it's it's not that hard. It's an exciting opportunity for um, people out there. And we, we would really love to um, see what you're working on and help help uh, progress, help, help incentivize some of those projects that, uh, that are happening. Yeah. Start building those dApps. And, and understanding the specific boundaries we have, I think echo just our values at mainframe. Uh, good design, good design is the answer to bring in users. Uh, obviously the SDK, the use of the SDK, uh, being able to navigate these emerging technologies that we talked about. And then also very importantly, this plays into uh, mixed comments and love for South America and the opportunity in South America is the social impact this technology can have. So social impact is always something that is uh, front and center in what we do at Mainframe and why we do it and what pushes us to do. Some of these, uh, you know, it, watching this, you're probably thinking some of these things are pretty ambitious, but well, we have reasons for that. I think, I think we feel it as a team and we have that excitement and there are reasons we're trying to do these ambitious things. 
we're going to change the world. <laughs> we're making it happen. We've got the team to make that happen. So we, we've got, we have bounty challenges um, out there for other DAP developers to build DAPs in our um, in, uh, environment. And we are also, like Neil mentioned, working towards developing some of our own DAPs to help um, bridge the space and bring users in. You want to talk a little bit about that, Mike? Yeah, so um, a platform you know, I, as an entrepreneur, I've spent a lot of time thinking and building marketplaces. You know, the first company that I started dropping out of Princeton was a marketplace connecting high school students with university admissions officers. And as we think about mainframe OS, you know, and kind of in a way a marketplace, you know, developers um, aren't going to be as attracted to start building on, on the platform until there are users. And users aren't going to come to the platform until there's some cool dApps. And so there's kind of this chicken and egg situation that every marketplace and every platform has to has to deal with. And so the way that we're dealing with it is that we're going to build some killer dApps to get things going, to spark to spark the ecosystem, spark momentum, bring some users in. Um, and as we grow the user base and the dApps that, that we in-house are building alongside some uh, partners, uh, developers will start taking notice and start seeing like, wow, this is a vibrant, growing community of users people who are excited to try dApps, and that will bring more developers into, into the network and into the community. So again, we are building a few of our own dApps, and we will, we will likely have a, a, a team of people who are constantly cranking out really killer and exciting and powerful dApps to put into the mainframe OS. And as we grow those users, more developers will start coming, because it's, it could be a great distribution channel, a great place for them to get adoption of their own dApps. Um, so yeah. That, that you will see some of that in the April launch. Um, you know, somebody asked, what's gonna be the big difference between this launch and the April launch? Would you all say that's probably one of the biggest differences? Yeah, and, and it gives us a chance to incorporate the, the feedback we, we received at the recent conferences as well as uh, dog fooding our own uh, platform during uh, what we kind of had uh, a few of the days when we had the whole team here, we had a, a kind of a, this internal hackathon pressure testing certain new ideas and protocols. And so that, that inspired us to make some changes and to get solidify uh, this, this first offering. So yeah, yeah, allow yeah. us to incorporate feedback. We want the feedback, we want to incorporate the feedback. We want people into, into the code, into our repos and to, to give that to us. We, we, do, we don't have all the answers. And so just like we have our bounties, we want everyone to build dApps on our system. We also understand that, hey, we're gonna work part of this too. We'll show you what dApps we're, yeah. we're building on this platform. So start building dApps and there are bounties if you wanna get bounties and uh, we, we look forward to your feedback. Yeah, so we outlined those challenges a little bit um, more in the blog post we put out yesterday, I think, on Medium, uh, or blog, sorry, blog.mainframe.com. Um, and uh, and like I said, come talk to us on Gitter. We want it to be we want to be hands on with anyone that's working on it and um, help you through it and see what you're working on. There have been some questions about partnerships. Yeah, let's, let's talk, talk about, about that. So, um, anytime you're dealing with big enterprises, just know that things go slower than what we want them to be. You know, that you're dealing with big organizations, bureaucracies. Um, and so with Telefonica specifically, that's, that's where it's at. You know, one of the exciting things about Telefonica is we're spending more time in South America. We're opening up an office there, as we talked about, and they have a massive, massive, massive reach in South America. And uh, you know, they're a, they, they, prov they provide uh, cellular service. They prov so as we think of like distribution channels and as we think about potential um, use cases of kind of bringing people into crypto, onboarding people into Web3, uh, working with Telefonica specifically around their users, their community, their customers could be really big. And so those are some of the areas in which we continue to explore with them, trying to find the right fit works that makes sense for them, makes sense for us. Uh, you know, we have a contract locked in, so it's really just trying to figure out, making sure it's a good snug fit. But again, we're, you know, our ambition is to tap into their, uh, I don't know, hundreds of millions of users, I don't know, tens of millions, I don't know exactly what it is, mm -hmm. in South America specifically. So it's moving forward, but when you're dealing with an enterprise, it never moves as fast as you would like. So that's that. Um, let's see, what are some other questions that we have here? 
we we mentioned another guest. Um, oh yeah, let's bring we, in another guest. Yeah, that, and you kind of talked a lot about our marketing efforts kind of centered around video at this point. We've had some success. Austin Ooh. Craig, who you will also recognize. <clears throat> Another Maybe if start. I take off my hat or if I still have my beard, yeah. I'd be right. He, Austin is incredibly talented. He, obviously, he's made many main and frame videos. He's yeah, done a lot of update videos. He's done a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, you were asking about videos that are coming up soon. Yeah, what are some exciting things that we're working on? So we've got a few videos in the pipeline. One of them is completely done already. Uh, a lot of you saw it, Dawn with the Daps, our lemonade stand video out in the, the wilds of the crypto wilderness. That's redundant wilds of the wilderness. <laughs> uh, but we've got another fun video like that, already done, just ready to go out the door at the right time. Um, it's a parody, it's a lot of fun. Any of you who are were watching late night television in the 90s might be familiar with what we're parodying. I'll just tease you with that. I can't wait. Got a couple more in the works right now. Um, one of them is a satirical video introducing an upcoming product, uh, DAP, that I think you're all going to really like. I personally am excited for this DAP and the video because they're both really cool. The video is going to be a lot of fun. Again, very funny. We Here's my philosophy with content marketing. We want to put out content that grabs your attention by, by virtue of uh, its own value, right? It's valuable to watch on its own merits, regardless of what it happens to be talking about. But then, because you're watching it, because it's entertaining or inspiring, I, we also want to to share with you what we're doing and why it matters. So, we're going to try to make videos that are genuinely fun and shareable and interesting, and then also you walk away with something, some some new information, some new new knowledge. So. And then the other video. And then the other video is is outlining our vision, our values, our hopes and dreams and ambitions for uh, the the full and final release of Mainframe OS. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. Because I just did. I just said. Yeah. It. You don't need to call it final. <laughs> no, it's not final. You're right. Okay. <laughs> the engineers are, are pushing back on me saying final. Nothing's ever final in software, right? Uh, it's always being built. It's always being developed, and it's always growing and moving forward. Uh, this is a video for the, the more public-facing release, shall I say. You, you've just seen the developer release of Mainframe OS. We're going to have a more public-facing release very soon. And this is a video to accompany that release to speak to a more layman audience, people who are not deep in the crypto weeds, uh, but want to understand what we're doing and how it impacts them and where it might take us in the future. Why did you shave the beard? <laughs> So the beard was, uh, I don't know, I don't know, man. There's, there's... Somebody says the beard is gone. Uh, sorry, sorry, guys. Sorry, emoji. <laughs> I had the beard for a long time, most of 2018, but uh, Change is good. I either got to deal with having the beard and grooming that and making it look good, which is kind of hard for me because it's kind of sparse in my, <laughs> my growth. I don't have the fullest, thickest beard, uh, or I've got to deal with shaving. It's one or the other. Take your pick. So I kind of go back and forth. Um, why do you think video is so important? Ah, this is a good question. Um, so video has been most of my career. I studied broadcast journalism uh, in college, and so using video to communicate information is a lot of what I've, almost all of what I've done in my career. Um, video is the best medium that I know of to communicate a message, to tell a narrative, and I'm a firm believer, this, this may be getting kind of far afield of what you intended to talk about, I'm a firm believer that the, the native way that people understand the world is through narrative, is through stories. When we're small children, I have two toddlers. I have a three-year-old and a two-year-old. Before they can even really talk, they understand stories. They understand characters and actions and motivations. And they start putting that together even before they can form sentences. Narrative is how we understand the world. And I think video does an incredible job of quickly and succinctly and effectively communicating a narrative, communicating, here's the story of what happened in a way that people can internalize, understand, appreciate, remember, and, and act upon. Ultimately, we want people to, to not just take this information in, we want them to do something with it. We want them to incorporate it into their lives, start using it. I know of no better way to do that than video. A five-minute video can communicate so much in a way that 
you know, would be much more difficult in a lengthy blog post, which is great for like pieces of information, reference, etc. But if we're trying to tell a story and motivate people, video is fantastic. It's what I've been working on my whole career. Yeah, someone said earlier, you know, are, are we having fun? Uh, I think the two videos we're going to be releasing in the upcoming weeks will show two sides of what it is like to be at the mainframe office or to be on team mainframe. At one, we are we are so aware of the challenges we face that we only have the ability to use humor to, to, <laughs> to combat some of that frustration that is out of our control. And we recognize that and I think we have that awareness to understand that and that is reflective in Dawn of the Daps, but we wanna use that to educate people on our frustrations. And then on the other video, what you'll see is the sincerity um, I, not, not as a counter, but as a companion piece to that humor we use to understand why, why we're using humor to put up with some of these frustrations because of where we want to go. So coupling our marketing material and these videos we're producing, you'll see this is what we believe in and this is how we cope with the reality, I guess is one way to say it. But you'll see this, the many sides of mainframe and hopefully that'll just visually explain who, who we are. Absolutely. We've got, we've got videos that you know, poke fun at where we are currently as, as a world, as a crypto market, but also really look forward to that beautiful vision of a future that is more equitable, decentralized, um, where people have power over their own lives and choices and, and how they engage with each other. Cool. Thank you, Austin, for stopping by to say hi. Well, thanks for having me, Mick. It was a real pleasure being here. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Austin. So we should probably start trying to wrap up. It's already been around an hour. We still have many of you watching, which is great. Thank you for being here. Um, so, I, so I have maybe an a idea of what we can talk about to kind of close it out. Okay. Um, so the history of mainframe includes um, many uh, shifts or um, starts and then realizing we want to go down this path oh wait the technology's not there we better build the technology now let's go down this path and now oh wait the technology's not there let's go you know um and we're seeing that uh again we talked about uh, eating our own dog food and building our own dabs that you know we've built this platform and we need to kind of help bring the users there by building the dabs um and we talked a little bit about the need to kind of continue to bridge web 2 to web 3 you know users and what do, and and so several of the questions have been where do you see mainframe uh, a year or two five years from now yeah where do you see this thing going yeah so um you know as we think about the mainframe os mainframe os is and will be the place in which people can start interacting with dApps, decentralized applications. Um, and, and the motivation there is around giving users more control, giving them more freedom of their identity, of their information, uh, their interactions, et cetera, giving them true freedom to connect uh, online in an unstoppable way, mainframe OS, and that'll continue to be the vision there. But as we think about the, the challenges of bringing people into Web3, there are many. They are big. We're going to start thinking about what are new features or products as part of the mainframe family and mainframe ecosystem, which can help bring people into Web3 without them even necessarily knowing what Web3 is, what crypto is, what tokens are. And so that's that would be one of the big themes of what we're going to be working on in 2019. You know, mainframe West is, is by April going to be in a very solid state. We're going to continue to build dApps there, and we're going to be focused on that. But we're also going to be thinking about, as we have, many of us have mentioned, how do we bring the next million users into crypto, into Web3? And so we're, uh, we're starting down a path of, of, of these ideas. Uh, how, do you, how do you usher in kind of this, this new group of people to start using Web3 in a way that's very simple, in a way that's very easy, in a way that's approachable, in a way that maybe they don't even realize that they're doing it? And using some of these new products as a way to then, you know, kind of a stepping stone into using DApps and using, you know, mainframe OS. Um, but yeah, the underlying motivation and the underlying vision really is around freedom. It's freedom, um, the freedom to, to to be able to communicate with whomever you want, connect wherever you want. Uh, freedom from, you know, surveillance. Freedom from censorship. 
Uh, and then the freedoms that I talk about a lot around economic freedom and, and allowing people to truly be their own banks, allowing people to participate in this global economy, global marketplace uh, without being told that they can't. And so, yeah, the theme will continue to be around freedom. I think the economic freedom will be a bigger theme that we focus on during 2019 and throughout because a lot of the economic use cases are use cases that are already available and usable and ready. You know, some of the, you know, we talk about decentralized finance. A lot of these protocols are already being used in a very significant way. They're already um, somewhat mature. I mean, not, not fully mature, but they're somewhat mature and, and they don't have the same requirements around scalability, you know, blockchain scalability as maybe other use cases do, like social media or gaming, et cetera. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think the economic freedom, financial freedom, the types of dApps that we'll be introducing, the types of products that we'll be introducing for non-crypto people are gonna be kind of in this, in this arena, in this general area. So, any thoughts or ideas around that? That was fantastic. Sounds exciting. <laughs> I'd like to. So people are, um, so yeah, hopefully you all enjoyed this. We should do it more often. We should uh, not wait until some big launch to do this, but we should probably do this more often. Thank you all for participating. It's been great to see all your questions. Sorry if we missed a few questions, but we'll try to do this more we'll make often. Up, make it up to them. Julia, yeah. come one little last uh, yeah. guest. We have one last guest here, the lion, the mainframe lion. Um, this is the mainframe lion, Julia. Julia, thanks for being on the show. Um, she is Clement's beautiful Chow Chow. Is that the breed? Yeah, Chow Chow. Chow Chow. Uh, how would Neil? How would you describe the relationship that we all have with her? Uh, Julia is in control of the relationship. Julia decides. <laughs> when and if she will be your friend around the office. And so it is up to you to be on your best behavior and just let Julia decide when she is ready. Uh, Julia is fantastic and if you ever get the chance to meet Julia, you will know that you will want to be Julia's friend. <laughs> yeah, Julia is an amazing dog. Um, I'm, you're all on Instagram stories right now. Thank you for you, you, you can see the look on, on her face. <laughs> she knows that she's in control in this, and she's ready for any of your questions. But she may not answer them. <laughs> She'll choose. Austin's taking a quick photo, so let's smile for the photo op. But Julia will smile when she wants to. <laughs> all right, all. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, feel free to ping us on Twitter, at mainframe underscore HQ. We're in Telegram. We'll continue to answer your questions, but 2019 is going to be a big one. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you.